You're listening to the Eldest Jiry Channel. <laughs> The Heart of What's Beautiful by Miles Voltaire Performed by Otis Jiry I'm not special. I'm not. I have to keep telling myself that, or else I'll perhaps wake up realizing that what happened that night in an early September oh, is not the end of things, but the very beginning. I digress. I apologize. It's just that even thinking about that night I saw him by the Conoco gives me a chill trickle of sweat right down my spine. It wasn't fear, exactly. If you had to put a name to it, it would be a strong desire to get the hell out of the way. He was picking over the trash can like a homeless bum, but when I shouted over to him to get the hell gone... He just gripped the rim of the can and looked up and grinned. I remember seeing those eyes. They were bluish white, and I don't know how I saw them that clearly in the dusk. It was September, after all. And the grin he had started from his lips and spread with a horrible rapidity all the way up his cheeks. Like a twig blown about by a fall windstorm, he almost blew away from the trash can. Cheap black overcoat billowing up around him. Couldn't have weighed more than a hundred pounds soaking wet. I went back into the garage once he'd gone. That grin haunted me. How could a sane person be grinning like that? With a mouth like a Halloween pumpkin and hair that tufted up like corn silk. Eddie was waiting for me inside. Had a mug of coffee ready, just as we were going to talk business like in the old days. The Conoco hadn't been doing too well since the latest highway alterations, and they built a new off-ramp in town just north of us. We'd agreed a sale, and I was going to tear down the parts of the garage that neither of us wanted. Hell, they were going to bulldoze it anyhow, but I wanted to take home some of the wood and the fittings. Once you've lived with a place for twenty years, it starts to get under your skin. Literally, as it happened. Just as I was prizing up a plank on the backboarding, a splinter of clean wood came and jammed itself into the flesh of my thumb. I remember swearing and pinching at my skin to pull the head of it up to the surface again. The blood beaded scarlet on the surface, and it slipped a little further into my thumb. I swore again, and then a new sound came through the air. Allow me, it said. And then, as though he were unfolding himself impossibly into the light of the workshop, that strange little raggedy man extended a hand. I'm naturally good with things like this. I'm pretty sure I didn't scream. It was kind of cold fear that must have set in or just surprised at having the guy appear, or offer, because I left my hand there in midair whilst he took it in his. Such pale, cold hands. And I remember thinking about him rummaging in the trash can, but there wasn't even a trace of filth on his hands. They were clean, and so very, very cold. Oh, here's the little villain, he said and took hold of my thumb and pulled the skin in one way and pushed down quite another, and with a fluid gush, the splinter floated out into the bead of blood. It trickled down his fingertips whilst he held, triumphantly aloft, a sliver of wood that had been stuck inside me. The blood dripped off his finger. It seemed such a lot for such a tiny cut, and his smile became wider. All better now, Willard? I smiled and thanked him, and called Eddie to tell him we had a good one here, until the small, silent part of my brain keeping score told me I never mentioned my name. Hey, you met Mr. Keller? That's great, buddy. You found anything else you want, Mr. Keller? Eddie hung on the doorframe, smiling like he'd just won a lottery. 
I looked at him, trying to convey exactly how weird this situation was. Him, me, and a stranger who looked like a Halloween prop. Eddie shuffled inside the workshop and handed Keller a paper cup full of coffee and patted me on the back as though he were placating a dog. Mr. Keller's kind of a legend back upstate, Willard. I got friends who know him. He's going to look around, and then he'll buy up a whole lot of stuff. You got a warehouse, isn't that right, mister? Quite right, Eddie. As a matter of fact, I'll take this one myself. He quickly pulled out a tiny baggie, no bigger than my finger, and plopped the bloody splinter into it. My tongue seemed to be unable to move, to beg the question that simple act made. Why the hell did someone want a bloody splinter? Oh, and of course, your pay. How much would you say that's worth to you, Willard? I think I blinked, but I certainly don't remember making a sound. If the thought of fifty dollars rolled across my mind, it was a joke. Nonsense. Who in their right minds would ever pay? And there we are. Agreed. Fifty dollars. I do love a man who doesn't ticker. He withdrew a wad of paper from his top pocket, but when it reached my hand, I could feel that it was indeed five tens, perfectly crisp and fresh, like they'd never been used. Eddie drifted off into the shop front as gently as a lamb. If I didn't suspect my drink had been spiked, I know I would have taken the whole damn mug in one swallow just to try and wake up. He was pulling tires out from the racks on the back wall. Oh, this one. No, not that. This one. And this. Isn't it a beauty? I looked. Mm, not much to distinguish one tire from another, but I could see they were all Eddie's inexpert retreads. The one he had called a beauty was something I perhaps should not have taken from the truck of an auto wreck a week or so ago, but no one had called it in missing. Not the insurers, and certainly not the two dead honeymooners whose jeep hit a deer and then landed end over end in the mossy pines. What, uh, what do you deal in, Mr. Keller? Those eyes, almost silvery blue in the low light. I followed him to the yard outside, watching him bool the wheels like they were iron hoops. Children's toys. Deal in pain, Willard. I deal in emotion. Everything that's ever seen pain, felt fear, witnessed horror, those are my goods. And believe me, there are many people willing to buy. I look at the heart of what's beautiful, Willard, and I make it even more raw and unrefined. That's why I need that tire jack. And it's why you'll give it to me, because I know how many people you killed with it on that long, lonely road outside Olympia ten years ago. So he knew. The bastard knew. My heart started to roar with the fear and relief of being found out. But I can feel its pain, Willard. I can feel all that anguish, all that terror, and such a strong current of joy that you could practically light up Seattle. I know that's yours, but in part I also know that some of it came from the man who helped you bury the bodies. I looked back toward the faded Conoco sign, and under it, Eddie. The old neon crackled in the slow, steady rain. Yes, Eddie had helped. I never thought for one second he'd start to enjoy it as much as he had, taking each corpse off into the woods and burying them God knows where. There was probably a mountain hike out there on the PCT, with a graveyard underneath it. You'll be wanting a shovel, then, I said, trying to make the uh, cold tremor in my stomach disappear long enough to think of a price. Uh, one th uh, nine hundred and fifty. An eldridge eyebrow went up. Yes, indeed. I surely love a man who doesn't dicker. And you, my boy, do not dicker at all. You are God's own gift to the man who knows what he wants. His smile grew by another two inches, 
crawling up the sides of his face. And I believe you know what you need to do to earn it. I whistled to Eddie just as I entered the garage. He poked his head up from under the counter and looked at me. Hey, Willard, what? The rest of the sentence never came. Or rather, it came out in a bubble of blood and snot and mucus, because when I swing a shovel, or for that matter, a tire iron, I'm accurate. Eddie's head swung off his neck, barely connected by gristle and vein. There was quite a bit of blood, but I pushed his shoulder, and he toppled back into the garage doorway, where it was a lot greasier and oilier, and the floor doesn't show dark stains so much. I left him there to bleed out, and then carried the shovel back to Keller, who was waiting by a Winnebago with its plates obscured by tape. And surprising, really. He opened the back doors, and I neatly laid the shovel inside, and it was then I started to notice all the other things there. Hospital screens, the disposable kind, bloodied, a child's shoe, a cup without a saucer, but some kind of brown residue stuck to the bottom, a few dozen syringes in a box. There were tools, dozens of them. I could recognize my own precious tire iron amongst them. I reached out to touch it one last time, but I felt his cold hand on my arm. Better not. Who knows what you might awaken? His voice talked of caution, but his smile wanted me to jump on back in there and make friends with the nameless things like me who ran around in the dark making these wonderful tools of emotion. I nodded, chilled by the wind. The Molotov cocktail I'd left to burn in the garage pit exploded serenely, and the rest of the building began to burn as we watched. In the same way as you can't recall having a conversation in a dream, I remember telling Keller about my life and who I was after I killed that family on I-90 and why I didn't think I was going to be arrested any time soon. Care to come along? I know you've got the knack for this job, a true talent, as it were. I could make you an offer, any money. Just think it, and I can match it. Some of the hot ash from the burning gas station landed on my arm, and I winced. Keller looked hungrily at me, as though he'd just been offered an hors d'oeuvre. In that half-light of flames and darkness, I saw his grin move another few inches ever upwards. I think I'll pass for now. I managed to croak, but I'm sure I'll be seeing you soon. Your choice, Willard, he murmured, and then with a fluid movement that made his legs suddenly seem six feet long, he snapped into the cab and rested his hands on the wheel. The rear doors shut by themselves. I'll be seeing you. Keep looking for the beauty in the heart of things. This Winnebago turned the last corner on the road ahead, and I watched it go. I'm not special but I can tell when things are. Used hospital screens that have seen deaths, the toys of a caught death child, the handkerchief clutched by a mother who heard her son was missing in action, the windscreen glass that witnessed carnage on the motorway. No, I'm not special at all, but I know a man who is. And I can name you his price. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen to this story in its entirety. If you enjoy what you hear and what I do and would like to support me and my efforts, visit my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Otis Jiry. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button and subscribe today and share this video with everyone on your social media. It helps more than you could ever imagine. Again, Thank you for listening, and have a great day. God bless you.